Well, hello there. Welcome into the studio. You are squarely tuned in to the Hidden Entrepreneur Show, the on-air button blinking brightly. We are ready to go. I am your host, Josh Carey. Chances are you've heard about various corporate leadership events and training. Now, have you ever thought that a classical music conductor can teach business leadership? And even further, have you ever thought that this teaching can be done while you are sitting on stage with a full orchestra? Allow me to explain. And side note, I love this so much because as you may know, I'm an artist myself. Having spent 15 years in New York as an actor, filmmaker, this is my world. I have the utmost appreciation and respect for all creative work and expression. And wow, is this a brilliant approach. Our guest is Roger Nirenberg, an orchestral conductor who over 20 years ago created the music paradigm. What is that? Well, in its most simple terms, the people of a company are seated within a live professional orchestra where they can observe highly trained musicians as they perform. How cool is that? The music paradigm is an engaging and unforgettable learning experience for any type of organization. The participant's attention is drawn to fascinating and unexpected organizational dynamics within the orchestra. I cannot wait to dive into all of this. Please help me welcome our guest. It is Maestro. Roger Nirenberg. How are you, Roger? Good morning, Josh. Delighted to be here. I absolutely appreciate that and your time. Like I said, this, this mixes everything that I love about the world and life around us, creativity, the arts, business, leadership. So let's, let's get right into this. How did I do in the basic overview of what the music paradigm is? I think that was great, but there was one thing that, that I, I don't agree with entirely, which is that I teach uh, my audiences of executives or, or you know, what, what, whoever the audience is, because it's many different kinds of organizations. But rather, I, I set up circumstances in which people can observe what's happening in the orchestra and learn from that. So it's not didactic in that I have knowledge that I'm imparting to them. Rather, uh, they, they, un, they can see clearly what's going on and they can discover parallels between what's happening in the orchestra and what happens in their, their own professional lives. And in fact, I design these role plays for the orchestra in such a way as to, as to uh, bring to people's attention that what's going on in the orchestra here is a lot like what they do at work all the time. And the relationships between the musicians are like the relationship that they have at work, either in, in leadership roles or in collaboration roles. It's so true because I spend hours on your website. And for those listening, we'll link to all of this. And what I love is you have these three or four minute clips on your website that show exactly that. And it's just fascinating to watch you conducting this professional two dozen piece orchestra with the participants of the organization, like, like seated on top of them right there. And I love how these little clips show how the conductor's relationship with the players, with the musicians, and like you said, the, the musicians, their dynamics themselves, it, it's all analogous to any business or corporation. Absolutely fascinating. How many of these exist meaning are you the only one doing this or are there other people doing exactly what you're doing well the metaphor of classical music uh and and business organizations is a very it's a very rich one and there are other conductors who who do presentations in front of business organizations but i don't think there's anybody who does what i do which is to uh to to plant these spontaneous 
metaphors inside the orchestra because first of all when i arrive in a city for example as i will the day the day after tomorrow in st louis i meet a new orchestra for the first time i have one hour to rehearse them and then the audience comes in and when we do this the orchestra does not know they don't know anything about the client and they don't know anything about what i'm going to ask them to do and so therefore it's it's completely spontaneous. And that's really important because the reality of this kind of learning, which is organizations uh, trying to adapt to the rapidly changing circumstances of the world and trying to gain some kind of competitive advantage or to, to survive, it means that they have to be able to change as circumstances change. And the fact is that people resist change and they, they don't want to be told that there are better ways to do things than the way they do, regardless of who it is who's saying it and regardless of how wise it might be. There's just a kind of attachment to previous success, attachment to what's familiar, and it's hard to break through that. It's easy to get people to nod their heads and but it's another thing for them to feel that they really want to change. But when music is introduced to, into it, music which is, has an emotional component, certainly has an elect, intellectual component, but it's emotional. And because it's touching their emotions, especially when they find a particular way that I've gotten the orchestra to play, beautiful and moving, um, it softens them up. And then the fact that it's so obviously spontaneous and real is very disarming. And it's impossible for them to get not swept up in it. And that energy that they've derived from that then becomes available to their organization. It becomes much easier for them to move forward with the agenda that they're trying to, to get across to their people. I absolutely love how all of this is bringing the the emotion of the the business people, the participants into it. And I love how you said that it now becomes available to them in their world going forward. Does a moment pop up in your career in history doing this? One particular moment that was overwhelmingly powerful in one direction or another, whether it was something you witnessed from a participant because of this or from a musician during this whole process? Well, there's so many that it's hard for me to choose one. But I think it's the expressions on people's faces. The, this expression of really fresh thinking, of reconsidering assumptions of of just pondering their their work the work that they do the way they do it the way they relate to people the way they conceive of their role the way they execute their role all this is is come it's not that they're questioning it but they're considering what it is that they're seeing and those expressions, and it's not only on the face of the executives, it's on the face of the musicians as well. Uh, I find that incredibly beautiful, this sort of moment of enlightenment. And you know, when enlightenment strikes, it's not Eureka, I found it. It's, it comes as a question. It comes as a possibility, something new to consider. And I think for an organization that is gold, that's what they're wishing that people could just open up and conceive of another way. I literally just got the chills as you're talking about that enlightenment. And I, 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 I've, I've made no, no secret that I'm a big fan of this for so many reasons. But is, is it true or is it a stereotype that let's just say classical music in this regard is it a bit unaccessible to the to the public and is that part of the value because when they are among it that sort of helps them overcome what they had in their head as an unaccessibility 
Well, almost always a, a large part of the audience is skeptical when they first walk in and then they take their seats, you know, inside the orchestra and it's hard to know what's going to happen. Uh, they don't know what's going to be asked of them. The musicians don't know either. So there's this whole, there's this whole sense of, of kind of possibility and mystery and a little bit of a threat also. Uh, and pretty soon I, I make sure that, that the, the, the room is a very pleasant place to be and everybody knows that fundamentally they're safe. Um, so uh, it's in that atmosphere that, and of course the skepticism is that this isn't gonna be relevant. This is a waste of my time. Uh, you know, what does this have to do with it? Uh, but that skepticism is healthy. And then they start to get, first they get swept up in the activity, just the physical activity. And all the stereotypes that they've had about classical music and about, you know, all the, the sort of barriers that people have to it, they kind of disappear, they dissolve in this just this, fascination with this activity that's happening and it's so physical it's happening right around them and the sound is coming to their ears and their bodies so they don't know what it means anymore and that's that's a great thing for making them available to actually feel the music um, of course that's the thing that i find so beautiful is that people feel the music it's not what my clients are interested. My clients are interested in organizational change, organizational effectiveness, elimination of error or reduction of error, you know, creating greater speed, greater efficiency, greater agility, all those things that, that so many organizations really, it's an, an imperative for them to, to do that these days. Uh, but the vehicle through which that learning takes place is also the opening up to the beauty of the music. So as an artist, because I fundamentally consider myself an artist, that's very fulfilling to see that as the music reaches them, their minds simultaneously open up. I've, like I said, I've devoured your website and um, I know that you've been written up, you've been featured not only in newspapers like the New York Times and on PBS NewsHour, you were featured with a, uh, an incredible segment. Who are some of your clients that you've had over the years? Well, I think if you look at the Fortune 100 corporations, many of them have, have engaged the music paradigm. They're also smaller organizations, uh, for example, a chamber of commerce of, um, of a, a, a small region, they engaged me because they found out about it. Um, there are many different kinds of clients, um, franchise organizations, I'm just sort of going over the list. But on the website, anybody can look, see this, this is a vast list of many, many corporations. And how many of these to date have you done? Well, there are hundreds. I, I, I've never counted them up, but certainly over 200, maybe 300, maybe, maybe more than that. Hmm. And you said tomorrow you're off to St. Louis. How does, how does it logistically work? A client hires you in some city across the U.S., and then you and or your team is now left with the creation process, right? So you have to go there and not only find a venue, but you have to find musicians. Is that basically the process? Well, normally the client is already having a meeting you know, uh, and they're trying to figure out, well, what are we gonna do with this meeting to, to make it memorable, to make it effective, to make it fun, um, uh, to accomplish our goals, whatever those goals are. And because I customize every presentation for every client. So it's never the same. There are many common elements, but it's always targeted to what, what kind of messaging is there? What kind of change? are they trying to bring about? So the meeting is already going to happen. The venue is already chosen. The audience is already there because it's the people who are there for the meeting. But then 
I, I network in my world to engage an orchestra. And I've done that in so many different places and more than a hundred different orchestras have participated in all over the world, um, in Asia and in Europe and Latin America and of course across North America. Um, and I've had inquiries in Africa, but I've never actually done one in Africa yet. Um, so, so I engage the orchestra and, uh, and then the musicians arrive, as I say, you know, we have a, a rehearsal just to make sure that the, they, the musicians are comfortable with the music and also with this unusual setup where they're kind of spread out much further apart than they normally are because the audience is embedded inside the orchestra. There is no other audience than that. And they're all looking at the conductor from the musician's point of view. So that takes a little while to get used to. Um, and that's the logistics of it. So you, you have a meeting or meetings with the organizer, with your client, and depending on, like you said, what their obstacles that they're looking to overcome, does that determine the musical piece that you're going to play? Yeah. So I, the question I ask is, what would be an outstandingly successful outcome for your meeting? If this was the best meeting that your organization ever had, and people said that they were, they were transformed by this, what would that mean? What would that be like? What, in other words, what are you trying to bring about? What are you trying to accomplish? And then I ask what's standing in your way. And based on that, I choose the piece of music and I choose the, uh, the set of role-playing exercises that I'm going to ask the orchestra to do. So for example, let's say uh, I say to an orchestra, we're gonna play this particular passage now, but I mean, these principal players are gonna completely devote themselves to this performance. But the rank and file of the section, the majority of the orchestra, is going to do as little as possible without getting caught. And of course, they've never been asked to do that before. And it's sort of fun for the musicians to role play that. And then, and then the, uh, the orchestra plays. And to many people's surprise, it sounds fine. It sounds perfectly fine. There are no mistakes. It sounds good. And then I, I generally point out that it shouldn't be surprising because that's the way most organizations work. And it shows that you can live with dysfunctions in your organization. And if you're just looking for messes to clean up, you're not gonna find that. And I say, you wouldn't consider this a dysfunction until you hear, heard the following. What would it be like if every musician used everything that he or she knows about music, about the instrument, all the greatest inspirational influences that they've had. What if you brought all that to bear on this performance? What would that be like? And then, and then of course, the orchestra gets very inspired by that. And, uh, and then they play, and it's astonishing to the participants to hear how the very same notes sound so completely different, and the energy is just, totally, totally different. It's overpowering. And then I say that this is a very challenging demonstration for any leader because it shows that within, within an organization, you have this latent capacity. And if you're a leader, it's your job to untap that, to create the circumstances that liberate that kind of energy. So that immediately makes people begin to question. What would it be? I imagine people are thinking, what would it be like if my people did that? What, what would that energy be that would be unlocked? And, and then what are the keys that I need in order to unlock it? So it's very provocative. Provocative indeed. So right there, the musicians are the, are the metaphor and analogy and parallel to the business executives, the participants, and your role is the role of CEO or the leader of the company. I, I read a quote of yours that I just love that supports this. You said, an orchestra is a great place to model organizational dysfunction. 
That's exactly what that example is. Mm -hmm. We show a dysfunction. In this case, you know, when people read that sentence, they think the dysfunction is people playing wrong notes or falling apart or playing. It's not that it's much more subtle. It's the kind of dysfunction that lives in the world. Um, and, uh, and as I said, it's, you don't see it as a dysfunction initially. It's only when you see what, it, what the potential could be that you recognize it's a dysfunction. I'd love to go back to the beginning of you and see how we got to this extraordinary place. If you don't mind, bring us back to Roger Nirenberg as, as a young, young child. What was life like then? What was growing up like for you? Well, I think it was a pretty normal childhood. Uh, we had a very free thinking kind of house and and the value on creativity and value on imagination, value on, on, um, on re rethinking assumptions. And, and uh, so that was part of my legacy. Um, but uh, I kind of discovered classical music I, uh, on my own. And it was, a, it was a new world. It was just, this amazing, fantastic energy that I, I'd never imagined. And even as a 10 year old, I, I kind of knew that that's what my life was going to be about. You, you said that growing up as a child, there was value on creativity and such. How, how was that relayed to you? And what was your parents' occupation? Well, my father was, uh, had, did many kinds of things. He, he was a lawyer. He had a, a career in real estate, but at a certain point in his, uh, in his life, he kind of changed direction and, and uh, evolved a uh, fresh thinking about how people negotiate and especially the role of lawyers. He didn't believe in the adversarial kind of system uh, dynamic. He thought that lawyers, sometimes they win, but not to the advantage of their clients. And, uh, and he wrote a book called The Art of Negotiating. And uh, it turned out to have made a, a really significant contribution. And, um, uh, and then he, he began a, a kind of second career as an author and uh, a lecturer and a presenter of seminars. Uh, and so that influence was always, always present in the home. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and uh, he was really eager to share uh, his ideas and his inspiration and uh, his outlook. When you were 10, you said you discovered classical music. What was that discovery? What was the circumstance around that? Well, it's kind of, it's hard to pinpoint, but there was, I must have been younger, I must have been nine or maybe even eight. Uh, there was a film that was shown in school, a science film called Our Mr. Sun, which was produced by Bell Labs. And I adored it and I craved seeing it again. And I, I begged my father, can you find a way that I can see that movie again? Um, and uh, it wasn't until much later that I discovered that the music in that movie was drawn from the Beethoven Third Symphony and the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, and that what I was craving actually was the music. Uh, and then when I, uh, my mother who, had, who had, was taking a music appreciation course and came home with a bunch of records, uh, and I, start, I started listening to the Beethoven symphonies, it was like this whole universe appeared to me. Uh, so that was sort of the, you might call it an accident, but it certainly was, there was no intention behind it. And when this happened as a eight, 10, now 12, and you're moving on through your life, did you think consciously that you would take that into a career? Well, I thought that well, my life was certainly going to be about that. 
And I wanted to be, I wanted to be like Beethoven. I wanted to be a composer and I started writing music. Uh, as soon as I learned to the, to read it, I started writing it. And so at the age of, I guess I was 13, I started studying composition with a, a, a well-known uh, uh, American composer named Elie Siegmeister. And he was in a, probably the primary influence for me. And uh, he really, uh, he was very thorough and he was very, very disciplined and and he was very serious about it. So I was very lucky to come in contact with him. Now, clearly, this is a skill, a talent that not everybody has, not everybody can do, clearly. And it almost seems like it, it was brought forth from within you at that young age. But I wonder if you were not exposed to that or let's say life had it where you were just not exposed to classical music in that regard. How do you, do you think it just would have lied dormant or do you think that something like that is always destined to come out sometime, some way? I really, I don't, I don't have any opinion about that question. I don't know what the big driver is in life that makes things happen. But this did happen, and it was, I mean, it, it shook me up to the extent that I knew that this is what my life is going to be about. Whatever that is, that's what my life is going to be about. And I think I've been true to that. And everybody around you, around you supported this, and through high school, you just had your eye on that prize? Yeah, I think so, and, and my family was very supportive. And what happened um, through high school or out of high school? How do you first put this into play? Well, um, you know, I attended uh, music camps and, and, uh, and music festivals. And, um, and then there's a, I wouldn't call it a career path, but music is all about learning and people are constantly, you know, learning how to better themselves. And, and, and that was what I did. Um, that's what all musicians do. You know, we're always working, we're always practicing, we're always developing. And I did that too through high school and, and college and thereafter. What was your first paid job in this art? Um, I was about, let's see, I was approaching 30 when, uh, when I got a job as the music director of an amateur chorus, the Pro Arte Chorale in uh, New Jersey, which had a, a great reputation. They had a great uh, music director who was my predecessor, John Nelson. And uh, that was my first job. And uh, I, I remember it vividly. It was very, very formative. And, and then you, you're now in your 30s. How are you spending your time and earning a living then? Um, How did I earn a living? It was through, oh yes, I was, I was teaching. I was teaching at Queens College. That's right. Uh, and, uh, and I had various other kind of freelance conducting jobs. I was conducting the band at Columbia University and, um, and I was piecing together a living and living, you know, as so many musicians do at the beginning of their career in uh, you know, very modest circumstances. And, um, and just, I was working on music all the time. I was trying to figure out how to turn myself into a conductor. And when did that turn become a reality? Well, when I, when I got into the Juilliard's uh, conducting program uh, and my teacher was sixth in Erlang, that was when I really found out what it was to be a professional conductor. That was an enormously uh, beneficial experience for be, being there. And then, and then I had my, my own orchestra at Juilliard, which was their, their pre-college orchestra, which was filled with geniuses and, and prodigies, and uh, many of whom have gone on to, to become the great musicians of, of our time. Uh, and that was a, a great relationship for me. Um, and... Uh, I learned by doing, as all conductors do. So you said in the Juilliard School, that's when you realized or um, saw firsthand, experienced firsthand, what it means to be a professional conductor. What does it mean? 
It means many things. I think fundamentally it means being able to come to an orchestra and to draw from them a, a, a kind of collaborative behavior and to inspire them uh, with a focus on a musical goal that they all understand and that then they all work together to achieve. So in, in my world, I understand because I, I've lived it, the, the relationship between a, a production, let's say a stage production of actors and performers and their director. Is that, for lack of a better example, the, the, the relationship between an orchestra and a conductor? Uh, there's a lot in common. Uh, the conductor, unlike the stage director, is part of the performance, is one of the performers. But it's kind of an ironic, uh, ironic role because even though you're the focal point, you're not actually making any of the sound yourself. And that is actually very much like an executive, an executive who, who, is, who is accountable for the entire operation and is giving directions to the entire operation, but then it's the entire operation that creates the value. Um, so the conductor is like that. And because you're not doing it yourself, because it's remote control rather than direct control that you're exercising, um, it's full of, um, it's full of uh, uh, ironies and, uh, things that are counterintuitive. Uh, so it's fascinating. The leadership of, uh, of the conductor's role uh, is just endlessly fascinating to me. And what makes it so that some conductors come and all the musicians, they, they give everything and they feel as though they, have, they are now fulfilling their destiny. And the same piece of music and another conductor comes and they feel um, disappointed and frustrated and, um, or as I overheard one musician once speaking confidentially to another about the conductor that they were working with in their orchestra that week, he said, until this week, I had no idea how boring a composer Brahms was, which is a comment about the conductor they were working with. Wow, and every single thing you're saying, like you have pointed out, is parallel to the executive's team and their responsibility. It's just fascinating for sure. At what point in your career did you get that aha moment and say, music paradigm, I can teach or not teach. I could be uh, um, a catalyst for allowing organizations to experience this. I don't, I don't, that was certainly not my goal. My goal was to find a way to, to get audiences that were not conversant with, with classical music, with not regular music lovers to feel music the way I felt it. That was my goal. And when I started this, it was to create this kind of active learning experience that had that goal. But I needed, I needed to figure out a target audience and I wanted the audience that could help the field of music the most. So I sort of targeted business leaders because I saw that business leaders, to a certain extent, they, they they have a huge influence on the on the, the our society as a whole. Um, but after I started doing it, I began getting feedback about how powerful it was purely in a business sense. Now that wasn't what I was really that wasn't what I was targeting. But I I thought well if that's the case, uh, why not go with it. And then I started getting invitations from business organizations to appear at very high levels. Uh, and I got into rooms that musicians don't normally get into. And I started rubbing shoulders with people that musicians don't normally meet. Uh, and that was when I saw that doing this uh, for business organizations actually could both um, further my goal of bringing music to more people and opening it up to them, 
but also creating more uh, employment for musicians. And, um, and then uh, uh, it became a kind of unexpected second career. What was your first career at that point? At that time, I was, uh, I was a conductor and I was music director of two orchestras, the Stamford Symphony in Connecticut and the Jacksonville Symphony in Florida. And, and I was just conducting concerts and rehearsals all the time and, and studying all the time. I was leading the life of a conductor. Which I'm certain was your, your goal, your dream, your love, right? You were, you were happy. That was, what, that was what I thought I should be doing. And you were? And I was doing it, but when I saw what happened in the music paradigm, and I saw that sometimes in the music paradigm, uh, I got a little bit closer to, to what the, the essence of the music was about. And I found that I was starting to liberate kind of uh, an inspiration capacity in the musicians in ways that I wasn't sure exactly how to do uh, in rehearsals and concerts. And it began to stretch me as, as an artist. Um, that was when I thought, well, this is something I can't ignore. I have to pursue this. Why did you choose the word paradigm? Uh, that's a great question. And there's a, a, lot of, a lot of meaning in that. A paradigm is a kind of a, a mental model. It's like, it's like a map of, of some kind of reality as we see it. It's a conceptual map. It's the way we conceive of things. And what I was doing was saying, what if you look at the world through the lens of music and you see musical phenomenon in the world around you. So if you see, for example, some kind of discussion and you think about, well, you know, these people are not really playing in tune because to play in tune, you have to listen to each other. You have to uh, be spontaneous and be in the moment and you have to value the composite result more than you do your own particular sound. What if they could see that discussion as an opportunity to create harmony, to create a chord? Um, and because uh, in, in French, the word uh, to tune is the accorder. It's to bring a chord. And so the musical metaphor, the musical image would change the way that you saw and thought about what was going on. So the music paradigm is taking the lens of music and looking at the world and seeing what you see. Out of curiosity, are there other genres of music outside of classical music that you just adore? Well, I'm pretty devoted to classical music and, and, and I focus my attention there. But there are other kinds of music that I enjoy, but it's not the same, it's not the same kind of religious devotion and spiritual connection. It's, it's the, and you know, when I, what I first saw in the Beethoven symphonies, that was something which was very spiritual and very big and universal and timeless and forever and everywhere. It was like a, it was like a universe. And of course, you don't find that in pop music you find other rewards. Uh, so I like feeling that music, but it's not, it's not what I'm primarily interested in. How did Beethoven do what he did? Uh, I don't know how to begin to answer that. Uh, he was a great musician, a great pianist. Uh, and he was... Uh, fantastic imagination, fantastic creativity. And then he also lived at a time when the world was changing in a huge way because he grew up into an aristocratic society. 
But then the French Revolution came and swept across Europe with this outrageous idea that everybody had a right to actually rule their own lives. Because before then, you were important in the way you fit into society and society would decide what your role was. And this notion of the liberation of the individual spirit came at his time and it, it, it became a kind of the source of inspiration. So Beethoven is the music of liberation. And then to further that, Beethoven had this amazing challenge of being the greatest musician in his age and going deaf. And how do you, how do you continue to live in the continuing isolation and from people? And so his music uh, developed this spiritual dimension and this, uh, so there are so many, there are so many things about Beethoven. I mean, we could, I could go on and I could talk about nothing else but that. What mantra do you live by today? I don't know that I have a mantra. Um, it, it's abundantly clear every day to me what I should be doing. And, uh, and so I go about doing it. And the challenge is how pure can my concentration be? which means how can I avoid distraction and how can I avoid, you know, especially distraction by discouragement, by, you know, the kinds of demons that everybody has that, you know, look to, to make you feel somehow diminished, to make you feel somehow smaller and to think about what you're not rather than what you are and what you could be. So how do you how do you steer clear of those kinds of things, and how do you how do you find the focus to to be productive, and then also to to be open and creative, and to pay attention to the the tiny little voices of of imagination that that you know in on the on the margins of your consciousness they're there, but if you can if you can pay attention to them and give them a little bit of time, a little bit of attention, you might find that those are the seeds of the big ideas that your, your unconscious has brought you. So I try to stay true to all of that. Today, you seem like every bit of a confident, well-established human being. And from your story, it seems like that that was inherent throughout most do you experience self-doubt or lack of confidence here and there? All the time. All the time. Every day. Frequently. I mean, I think that, that's part of it. And anybody who, who's interested in growing has to accept that. That if you're going to open yourself up to feeling a lot of things, some of the things that you're going to feel are things that don't feel particularly comfortable and um, don't make you feel good about yourself. I think that is, uh, that's the price that you pay for wanting to grow. Do you believe that everything happens for a reason? I don't think I do. Uh, it's easy to say that, but to really believe it, I do think that it's very important to get on, on the side of being with what is happening rather than kind of trying to control things and make things happen the way you want them to happen. I think that there's, there's, greater, there's greater satisfaction, there's greater joy, there's greater purpose if you can find a way of being with what's happening and that it, you can be okay with it. You can, say th you can see things around you. You can see people behaving in ways that you don't approve of. You can say th see things happening, but that you can, you can find a way to find peace and comfort with what is going on and not have to sort of 
turn it over and throw it away and and become negative about it and and you know um, and separate yourself from it i I try to join with what is happening and then see if there's a role for me to play to transform it um, into something that I find good and beautiful and that, that I believe in. Magnificent. Are you spiritual or religious in any ways today? Well, I'm certainly not, not really a, a participant in organized religion, but I mean, you can tell from the way I'm talking that this is a kind of spiritual orientation and a curious thing, you know, because, you know, some people think I'm a business consultant and I do play that role in, in, you know, a certain aspect in what I do. And, and people are often astonished at how effective uh, the intervention that I've invented is for their people, how it accomplishes things that they, that they themselves are trying to do. Uh, But it's all entirely integrated with this artistic purpose that fundamentally is the thing that drives me. Hmm. What do you believe happens when it's all over? (laughs) I have no idea. And I'm very comfortable not knowing. And there's no fear around that? No, I don't think I'm afraid. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying trying to think if there's some some deeper with when whatever happens whatever happens i'll see when it happens and i'll try to figure that out and figure out well you know where do i fit in and where do my values fit in now and and what kind of role can can i play what happens next for you is it much more of the music paradigm well you know next the, the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go and attend a rehearsal at the Metropolitan Opera where my my very dear friend Mark Elder is conducting and I'm going to try and hear some of that rehearsal and then um, and then when when you know as soon as I have some time on my own I'm going to practice I'm going to practice the piano and, and per, yeah I'm, I'm going to give thought to the to the uh, the session that I'm going to deliver on Saturday and plan that and find how am I going to marry the music to the to the uh, objectives of the organization that I'm serving. Uh, and that's my day. And in the bigger picture, where are you going from here? Well, I think that I'm giving thought to what happens to my clients when I leave. I'm there for them, not even a day. I'm there for like three hours. Sometimes we'll have lunch afterwards, so maybe that extends it. But basically, my time with them, with the clients and with the orchestra, I'm there for one hour, and with the clients, two hours. So, yeah. And then, you know, they get very, uh, how would I say it? They get charged up. They get charged up with this feeling of possibility and this inspiration. But then I go away. And I think that there, there are ways that I could deliver value to them. Uh, without actually having to myself show up. And that's what I'm expanding. I like making videos, and all the videos you see on the website were videos that I edited myself. And so I'm exploring what kind of tools I can create, and especially what kind of collaborators can I find uh, who, who are simpatico with what it is that, that I'm devoted to and have a different expertise than I do, and where together we can create something which is greater than I could do myself. Hmm. I will leave you with this one final question. How would you, Roger Nirenberg, like to be remembered? Well, actually, I've given some thought to that because uh, in this book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is very well known. It's a classic. I read it. it. It had a huge influence on me. It was where I kind of found the word paradigm. And um, because there's this beautiful uh, uh, 
couple of pages where he talks about paradigm and paradigm shift. Uh, and I was reading it at that time. But there's, uh, there's one of the habits, one of the seven habits is begin with the end in mind. And he asks you to imagine your, your funeral and um, imagine that you could, you could witness that. And what would you like people to say about you? And then use whatever your answer is to inform you about what you ought to be doing today, what you should be, what you should be thinking about, what you should be devoting. That's beginning with the end in mind. So I've been contemplating that, and I thought about what I would want people to say about me. And I think I would want people to say that he was a really good listener. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's all I can say. It's just, this has been um, such a rewarding dialogue. I, I don't know if you publicly post your next uh, clients, but if you do, I'd like to do everything I can to quickly get hired by them so I could participate in one of your extraordinary events. I'm certain it's life-changing. I no, want to thank you. I will try to find a way to invite you to, to a session. They don't often happen, you know, in the New York area, but they do sometimes. And uh, mm -hmm. if not there, you know, someplace close, there's a session that we're doing in Washington that's coming up. And I'd love to invite you to that. Um, so let's stay in touch and uh, you'll be in the audience and then you'll see, you'll see what this is like. And I'm going to say to you the same thing that I say to my clients when we're talking about the session. I say, I say to them, raise your expectations because this is going to be bigger and more important than you can imagine right now. Because as much as they can imagine the ideas and what it is I'm trying they can't imagine the effect of music. And, you know, I, I love the idea of splitting the atom because what you have inside the atom is this enormous energy, potential energy, but it's locked in and it'll never come out until you have the process of fission or, or fusion, you know, that releases that. And I feel that way that there's this incredible energy inside of music, this transformative energy, but that for a lot of people, it's locked up. And what I try to do is create the, the circumstances where the energy of that music is released. And that's what nobody can envision beforehand. And that's why I have no, I, I don't have any equivocation about saying to people, raise your expectations. Mm. Well, First, I'm the, I'm the type of person, admittedly, that cries at commercials. So I know that uh, sitting in your presence under that circumstance, uh, I'm sure some, you know, there'll be some uh, Kleenex available, perhaps. And in all seriousness, I would literally travel anywhere that is necessary to uh, take you up on your very generous offer. We'll make sure that it happens. Ah, oh, my goodness. Maestro Roger Nirenberg, thank you, sir, for your time, for your openness and willingness to share all that you know with us. It's been extraordinary. And for everybody tuning in, I hope that this has been extraordinary for you as well. If you found some nuggets, some inspiration, go and put them into action. It's the only way to make beauty happen. We're going to do this again real soon. And until we do, go get them. <laughs>